We're going to talk about auditory evoked potential and the decision making on there. Now you might have stopped here. You might have stopped and say, well, I'm not doing evoked potential or vestibular. Um, but then you might change your mind sometime, especially when the doctor uh, moves in who is maybe a different philosophy than the original doctor and he's going to order these tests regularly and it would become a very good, um, uh, very good di a business decision for you. Uh, and so, uh, auditory evoked potential, what are the choices? Uh, manufacturers and things have changed here. The most popular auditory uh, evoked potential system in the United States for a long, long time used to be biologic. Everybody's really familiar with biologic. Most audiologists have learned on biologic. Biologic was started by two, uh, two guys from Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv, Israel, uh, who uh, immigrated, their father did, uh, and, uh, and, and the two sons immigrated to uh, Chicago. And uh, these guys started the business in their father's basement. Biologic started in their father's basement. Uh, these guys are great and very innovative. They were on top of everything. Uh, but they um, sold the business for $66 million to Natus, a company called Natus. And that was the end of Biologic after a few years because they didn't do any development and then the um, components started to become obsolete. Like you, you, you constantly have to develop an audiometer, come out with a new model, move it forward. Uh, because what happens is components become like you can't get the microprocessor chip anymore. You know, you can't make it anymore. You've got to develop a new one. Uh, and if, if the new generation never happens because your research and development is zero, then eventually it will die. And that's what happened. So you got to know what manufacturers are out there and which ones have different things. Uh, is it one or two channels? An audiologist would typically want two channels, MC and Contra. Uh, and does it have to be portable? It is an advantage for it to be portable and essentially today all systems are portable. Before your time, long before you were born, uh, and Giovanna knows this, that auditory evoked potential systems used to be big. I mean really big. And, and, and they were built, you don't remember these? They, they, they were, they were built into uh, carts that had wheels on them and you would push them. I remember when Children's Hospital still opened in Birmingham and they didn't have one yet. And so um, Dr. Borton, Tom Borton and I would push across from right across the parking lot a system that we would borrow uh, from uh, UAB, University of Alabama in Birmingham. Uh, and whenever we got across the parking lot into what was Children's Hospital then, which was very small compared to what it is now, uh, it wouldn't work. And so we had to open it up because the, the vibration, the, the circuit boards which were plugged in would actually fall out. We'd have to plug them back in again before we could use it. <laughs> uh, now today we could carry what was on that giant cart that weighed several hundred pounds, we could carry in the palm of our hands today. You know, but anyway, so uh, two channels, uh, portable, they're essentially all portable. Uh, and today, they all have clicks and tone bursts, right? So you can do frequency specific testing as well. Uh, there is a new stimulus that's getting very, very popular and works well if it's done well. So several of the manufacturers have really perfected the chirp stimulus. And so for somebody who's doing a lot of frequency specific threshold work, whether it's frequency specific or not, but a lot of threshold work, this uh, chirp, if they get the right system with the right chirp on it, there's ones that work and ones that don't work so well, but a good one, this could cut your testing time definitely in half, right? By using that type of stimulus. Are you going to have to do electrocochleography? Uh, all of the systems now will do electrocochleography. Only some of them have chirps. Uh, will you need to do VEMPS, ev uh, vestibular evoke myogenic potential testing? 
If you're doing vestibular, in today's word, you probably will want to do VEMPs. And uh, if you're doing cervical VEMPs, that's a C-VEMP, then you will want, if you can, get a system that has an EMG monitor built in. It's going to monitor the, uh, uh, the potential of the sternocleidomastoid muscle here, right? Uh, because that is critical in obtaining a cervical VEMP response. And uh, you can easily have a false positive asymmetry if you don't do that, and you will, uh, you will be investigating a problem that doesn't exist. Uh, so that's important. Do you, would it be nice to have OAE built in? Uh, what about ASSR, auditory steady state response? Uh, that's a, another option on some of these systems. On some of these systems, the ASSR stinks. Uh, it's almost impractical, and on others, it's actually great. Uh, what about non-sedated ABRs? Am I doing pediatric patients that I can't sedate, uh, but I want to do ABR anyway? Okay. There is especially one system out there especially designed for that type of thing that works um, in all the years they've been working on it, they now have got it where it actually is practical for that in certain cases. I had one doctor in, in pediatric e ENT of Atlanta went to a conference, listened to a sales guy in an exhibit, says to the audiologist when he came back, he said, call Greg Olick, I got to have this, hands of the brochure. Uh, and uh, he says he's going to do non-sedated ABRs on everybody now. Right? No more going to the OR for this. We're doing non-sedated. Right? He was really sold uh, a crock here. Okay? Uh, you've got to, um, and they soon realized that that's not practical. Okay? Even though it caused hell in the practice while they were learning this. Okay? Because the doctor was uh, insisting on these threshold ABRs on patients that were not candidates for a non-sedated threshold ABR. For example, the wild crazy kid who's running down the hallway pulling the electrodes off is not a candidate. Uh, everybody who does pediatric uh, ABRs can envision some patients that if you put an iPad in their hands with the right kind of little game on it, they'll be quiet, you know, or a cartoon or something. They'll sit there. They, they won't lay down and sleep, but they'll sit there, you know, and just watch the thing uh, and relatively quiet. Well, that kind of patient, absolutely. Uh, the patient who's just going to be running down the hall uh, screaming is not a candidate, no matter what they tell you. Uh, so is this something, then there's special systems for that. Uh, infant screening, automated infant s screening, you know, all the kids that if they're tested in a hospital, babies tested in a hospital with ABR, then screening, then you, if you're going to retest them, you've got to do it with ABR. And is the clinic so busy where you don't have time for that and you want to be able to get a technician, a nurse or somebody to do a screening where they just learn how to put the electrodes on and a, uh, an insert in the ear and then the system is a pass or fail algorithm. That could be built in. Uh, and this is extremely important, noise immunity. Uh, I've got a case right now in Huntsville, it's Huntsville ENT, they uh, they have in their building an MRI machine in another practice, okay? They cannot test what this MRI is running. So whenever they're seeing patients with that, you cannot do an ABR because there's so much electromagnetic interference that it won't work. It's just full rejections, okay? Well, some systems have terrible noise immunity. You know, if you don't have a perfect electrical interference situation, nice and clean, then that's fine. I've had somewhere, even in a regular office, I had one, bought a system, uh, this is in uh, Anniston, Alabama, um, and as soon as I tried it on myself, I listened to it when I'm installing it, and I could hear a country radio station, uh, th the clicks, yes, country radio station and the clicks. I go, what? I thought the gr there was no ground in the building or something. I'm testing everything, you know. And when I look at the EEG on the screen, it's just, you know, it's clipping out. It's going nuts. Uh, so I finally go to the audiologist and I say, 
is there a country radio station around here? She draws back the curtain, and outside the window, you could throw a rock at it. Giant AM transmitter. Okay, that system will not run in there. Yeah. Well, what are we going to do? We can't move. I can't move my, my practice. I'm stuck here, and I have to do it. You know. Uh, well, some systems are noise immune enough to operate under those conditions. Some, never. You never test one patient with it. And you could buy that and be stuck with it. Uh, uh, it's just whoever's putting it in there and recommending has to have enough resources where they could, t they could put something in there that's going to work. Uh, I have somebody in, in well, I mean, I, so many of these cases. Uh, and some are very noise immune, some are terrible. So, it's just something to know. So, what are we, what's out there today? Uh, this is that system that if you want to do non-sedated pediatric uh, ABRs, this is the best system to be interested in. It is made by a company in Toronto called Vivosonic. Uh, when this first came out, I thought it was nuts. Uh, and, uh, and they were way overselling it, but they've done so much development. In fact, I am a consultant for them. I visit their plant. There's 35, peop 35 geniuses in there, and this is all they do, all day long, just one product. Uh, and they've, they're doing very, very well with that. It's very, very practical. And it is extremely noise immune for electrical noise and everything. has to be to be able to do um, pe pediatric non-sedated ABRs. So that's, that, and that will, do, uh, that will do other testing like electrocochleography and all too. It's clinical, it's two channels. Uh, one of the most popular systems in existence today is the Interacoustics Eclipse. It does everything, including EMG monitoring for cervical vents, uh, and it is extremely noise immune. Uh, it has some of the same noise immunity features that the VivoSonic Integrity does, Interacoustics Eclipse. And of course, there is the Grace and Stadler uh, Audera. This is the least expensive two-channel clinical uh, auditory evoked potential system in the United States. It's about 14,700 uh, without the computer. You can use any uh, Windows 10 computer. Uh, this, uh, the Interacoustics Eclipse has, last year this was our most popular. Uh, this is about 18,500 without the computer. There are options on all these things but this just basically. And this uh, VivoSonic Integrity is about 18,000 also. Uh, uh, or maybe it's 18,9 and it inc includes the computer. There are also infant screeners. Uh, uh, here's a brand new handheld size of an iPhone infant screener with an excellent algorithm in it. Average test time on babies that are sleeping. 23 seconds per ear, ABR screening, okay? Uh, it's called a Novus, Grace and Stether Novus, handheld. Uh, you can get it with just uh, automated ABR or with uh, included automatic uh, OAE tested testing as well. Could be one or the other or both. And of course the Titan can have uh, ABR, automated ABR too. Uh, same algorithm in both of those. Both companies are owned by DeMont, Litley and DeMont. And so um, they both uh, average test time. We did part of the clinical trials on it at the Cab Medical Center, which is only a few minutes from my office. Uh, we did clinical trials on all of these to determine what the average test times were. So when I tell you 23, 23 seconds per year on a, uh, you know, a quiet baby, that is true.